recording right now? All right, sounds good. Okay, guys, so yes, uh, happy Friday. Welcome to this Miami Champagne Week webinar. Uh, my name is Alessandra Steves. We have our guest um, tonight, Rafael Benassi. We will introduce ourselves in a minute and we will talk about Miami Champagne Week. Um, I have to give you a little piece of advice at first that this is not going to be a very educational presentation like we have done in the past, okay? It is Friday night, we have champagne, and we will remember the great events that we did together. Now, um, three weeks ago or four weeks ago, we had a presentation called Sparkling Life. It was a webinar, and that was very educational. Remember when we had Bollinger, it seems like a year ago, it was just a month ago probably, okay? So go ahead and check that presentation on YouTube. And in that presentation, we talk about champagne methods, about the grapes, about the region, and so on. So in here, yes, we are going to, you know, go down the memory lane and, and talk about October 2020, all right? Okay, so let me start by uh, saying that, you know, all of us, I cannot see you and I cannot hear you. So if you want to communicate with us, you have to type on the chat box, okay? Make sure you type to all panelists and all attendees so everybody can uh, see your questions as well and comments. So you can see me and hear me, but I cannot see you and hear you, all right? So use the chat box, please. So a um, little bit about me. Uh, I think most of you do know me, but you know, just in case, my name is Alessandra Steves. I am the director of wine education and co-founder for Florida Wine Academy. I have the diploma in wine and spirits and I am a master of wine candidate as of right now studying uh, to pass this exam. Uh, at the Florida Wine Academy, we do some very fun um, events. So we have the Miami Champagne Week every October, okay, Vino Summit which uh, is um, a trade event. So it is educational, um, education seminars, and this was done in March this year. And we do have 305 wines. So some of you bought um, the champagnes from us. Thank you very much for helping our small family business. Keep on doing that. And yes, yeah, so 305 wines, it is also our um, web sh um, shop, okay? And uh, so I would like Rafa to introduce himself so we can start the presentation. Awesome. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. And uh, thank you for taking the time to log on. Uh, this is very exciting uh, for me to have uh, this uh, invitation to co-join with uh, Alessandra and uh, Florida Wine Academy. Um, with that said, a little bit about me. I'm a uh, native Italian, born in Luxembourg, and uh, started essentially in the wine business through uh, the passion of my father in the hospitality business. Um, my dad's in the cruise line business. So at the age of 10, I started uh, working for fun in the summertime on a cruise ship and uh, from the kitchen to serving to whatnot. And I was always surrounded by beautiful alcoholic beverages. Um, so uh, being that we're um, European, we are a little bit more relaxed uh, back in Europe. So um, in 16, 17, I went to uh, college in Switzerland and uh, specialized in hospitality management uh, at La Roche University. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Science in uh, Hospitality Management, International Management, and two associate degrees, one in uh, Food and Beverage Culinary and one in Beverage Management. Um, took that, went to uh, Four Seasons uh, out of college, and Walt Disney World did a little bit of uh, working for both of them. Transitioned to Hillstone Houston's uh, Restaurant Group, where I was the uh, Southeastern regional buyer, managed 11 restaurants, had a $12 million wine budget annually. So that was a lot of fun. And uh, after that, I transitioned to Breakthrough Beverage, uh, where uh, most recently I've been the director of uh, European business development and represent over 330 suppliers, about 3,000 just under SKUs of wine. Um, certified uh, wine som, I'm a level two WSET recipient going for level three, and I'm gonna continue forward like uh, Alessandra here eventually to diploma and master of wine. So 
Uh, welcome today. That's enough about me, but uh, please feel free to reach out uh, to me via Instagram or email if you have any further questions. I'll post my email here later on so everybody can have access. Thank you. Yeah, so, okay, guys, open the Ayala, and we have a person coming here saying hi. Just want to say hello, guys. Enjoy. Cheers. Stay, yeah, get at home. Stay here. Taste the champagnes with us. I'll have a bottle later. Bye-bye, guys. A bottle? <laughs> <laughs> a ball. Yes. I agree with him, you know. Um, right. When it comes to champagne, I, I personally enjoy magnums, especially when I'm alone. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. So, cheers, guys. Um, go. Salute. Chin -chin. We will talk about the Ayala, but just, you know, salute. All right. I see my brother is in here. Hi, Rick. All right. Okay. So, we are all passionate about champagne, okay? Um, so we, when we moved to Florida four years ago, and by the way, Florida Wine Academy turns four this weekend, this Sunday. So we are celebrating um, Florida Wine Academy anniversary this Sunday. And we decided to do our first event in Miami. And the first event was about champagne, okay? So this was the first event we ever did at Florida Wine Academy in Miami. Um, and I wanted to show this picture to you guys because um, it is, you know, first of all, you see the champagnes uh, that have supported us from the very beginning. Okay, so you see Champagne Ayala in here, Bollinger in here, okay, and Delamotte. And you see, I had a full class, um, you know, with people. But Rafa, do you know this guy in here? Yeah, no, I was noticing how uh, how many white hairs I have in the current <laughs> back there. Oh, geez. <laughs> so um, this is Rafael Benassi seated in here. So he came to attend. Uh, you know, of course, uh, the company has given us the champagne, so he came to to attend and see. He was, you know, he participated a lot, made great questions, great comments, great input, never in, in uh, you know, and he knew the champagnes much better than I did, but uh, he never interrupted me or tried to, you know, get over me trying to say anything. And uh, these were his friends, his baby. So he knew about the champagnes much more than I do. But you know, he, he was very, uh, he respected and made great questions and comments and so on. And I never knew that, you know, he was the guy that he was. So that was really funny. So yeah. I have to say that you represented the brands very well and you spoke about them uh, diligently from the heart and <laughs> your presentation that day was extremely uh, uh, genuine and uh, very well put together. And that's what intrigued me to um, you know, continue on uh, this embarkment with you, especially when it came to champagne, obviously, so. Of course. Yeah, another person that it is in the audience right here, do you recognize this person, Brenda? Yes, exactly. So this is Brenda. So she was in the audience too. And when I finished the presentation, she came to me and said, I'm going to be your best friend. And I said, oh my gosh, you know what, what? So it was <laughs> very funny. But I wanted to show you uh, the wine mats in here, okay? So these were the wine mats. And back then, you know, Guilherme was still um, moving back and forth and we were moving from Guatemala. So you see, I prepared the wine mats. And you know, for those of you who know him and know me, you know that this was not done by him. <laughs> so I'm going to show you his wine mat later. Okay. This was mine. So, so yes, but we, we all start, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, from the beginning. All right. So one event in 2016. So then it came 2017 and we said, okay, we have to take this to the next level. So what about we do four events and then we did. Okay. So, okay, but before we, we taste, all right, guys, it's tasting time. I, I love the presentation because, you know, it tells me what I have to do. And by the way, the presentation was done by Guilherme as well. Thank you. So, Raf, uh, tell us about the champagnes. All righty. 
so Ayala Brut Majeure. Um, let's talk about a couple things first. So the, the, the prominating names of Champagne, ironically, are actually German. And this name is actually Spanish, which leads me to uh, its beginnings. So in 1860, uh, this is when the house was founded, and a gentleman by Edmund de Ayala uh, was invited by Mr. Uh, Vichinscon de la Monde uh, to come to Champagne because um, Mr. Ayala had a lot of lucrative cash. Um, and Mr. Vichinscon was looking for somebody to assist with uh, some financial needs. Make a long story short, uh, Mr. Edmund Ayala fell in love with his niece of Mr. Vichy Scant, who ended up getting married to her and then inherited about 13 uh, uh, hectares at the time, uh, which today became over, or actually today the holdings are much smaller. But uh, over time, they ended up having over 200 hectares and became one of the flagship or grand marks. Um, they were a uh, second grand mark and established a grand mark uh, um, symbol, if you will. Uh, back in uh, 1882, so for, uh, first founding 18 Grand Marks. Um, the style here of Ayala is 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 definitely something you need to talk about because Mr. Ayala uh, did not have a passion for sweet wine. And during this time in Champagne in the mid 1800s, you had uh, champagnes that had 220, 250, 270 grams of sugar. Um, and Mr. Ayala came out with something somewhat uh, controversial uh, because he didn't like sugar. So he went down to his cobs and uh, spoke to uh, uh, the cellar master and said, hey, what if you don't put any sugar whatsoever? And the cellar master told him, well, your wine is going to be brut. Ton vin saint brut. And in French, brut actually means ugly. And what the winemaker was trying to say is that your wine wasn't going to be sweet, it was going to be harsh, and it was going to be somewhat astringent on the palate. And, and Mr. Ayala says, yeah, but I don't like sugar. So they created the first dry style of champagne, which was actually 22 grams per liter at the time. Okay. Today, Ayala, the, the, uh, the beverage you're actually drinking right now is seven grams per liter. So just to kind of give you an idea, of how this drastic change going from 250 grams down to 22, which today is a demi-sec, and in today's time, they're down to seven grams. We can start to taste sugar at six. So really, this is just a hint of dosage, um, making a very, very light, very crisp, very elegant, very uh, floral uh, type of wine. It is dominated by Chardonnay by 40%, equal to with Pinot Noir. Uh, it is also uh, housed to one of two um, female winemakers in the southern part of Champagne because uh, they come from the city of Ai. Ironically, we're tasting two of the four female Champagne winemakers on this webinar today. So um, Jennifer uh, Colleen is the winemaker and uh, she has been there since the beginning with 2010. And uh, the winery actually went out of business and bankrupt because of prohibition. And the chateau remained within the family, but the business was shut down. And the Bollinger family actually revived Ayala in 2005, spent five years creating reserve wines and working on the 30 hectares that they have right now of estate fruit. And also blended together with the Bollinger estate uh, family grower program. So um, that's how they're staying alive today. And uh, I really love this style. This is a piece of history and uh, in a nutshell and really kind of gives you the window to what Brut is today. Um, and I really love the fact that this wine, though, is only seven grams per sugar, still has some beautiful fruit ripeness. So you may be getting that, you know, a tangible sweetness on the palate of some sort, but that's really the ripeness of the fruit. Um, the base of the Chardonnays are really coming from Grand Cru. Uh, in the Côte, uh, Côte de Blanc. Uh, the Pinot and the Pinot Meunier come from the area of Reims and uh, uh, on the uh, upper east side of Reims. It's delicious. So, um, so I'm tasting this in, in the Rito 
glass that I have that is not a flute, it is a tulip. And I see a lot of tiny bubbles. Um, and, and, you know, it is fruity, but yes, the palette is dry. It is just super balanced and delicious for $37. I think it is a great entry level champagne. Guys that you're tasting, um, what do you think? And I asked a couple of them if they have tasted Ayala before. So some of them said yes. So yeah, it is not as famous as, <clears throat> as other champagnes as Bollinger, but um, yeah. Yeah, so Jacqueline yeah, is agree. saying, so I is agree. the drink, yeah. This is a very versatile style um, of champagne, uh, great aperitif uh, to kind of get you kind of going. Uh, but you know, you can also have things such as uh, sushi, uh, which would probably be one of my favorite pairings for this, uh, for this wine. Uh, oysters as well, shellfish, uh, obviously any type of seafood, uh, salads. Um, but you know, you could also have it uh, after dinner maybe with a little uh, uh, raspberry tart or something, something that has uh, some high acid fruit tones um, to keep it fresh. All right, sounds good. So let's move on. And meanwhile, keep enjoying your Ayala because we have some more things to cover. So this is then 2017. So 2017 is when we did, an ev so four events. First one was at Abaco Wine Bar in Design District. And uh, you know, this picture of happy people, these people are still with me today. So I'm very thankful for having, you know, all these clients. So Lucy, Mario, Erin, Claudia, Louise, and then Jared, Helen, so, um, yeah, so all these clients are still with us and they try to come every year and, and they come to, to other tastings as well. Uh, funny facts is that, you know, so you see Henry Brimo um, working for Abaco in here, but Nicole Ramos was working for Abaco that day as well. She was, you know, not our employee yet. Um, so, yes, this was really, you know, an event that um, changed a lot of things and the lineup was just amazing because you know we had we had Krug and um, uh, Cristal, Don Perignon, Paul Roger, we had Bollinger, La Brandonet 2005 I think it is, we had Charles Heitzig, Blanc de Millionaire 1995 um, and Celebris Gosset 2002 so and the Armand de Brignac okay so we had our favorites but you know overall fantastic champagnes and that was a Monday. And you know, these people made the effort to show up on a Monday. So I appreciate that. What a Monday lineup, I have to say. <laughs> True. <laughs> okay, so the week uh, continued. And okay, I have a video. So, all right. Every time I have a video, I have to stop. And now is the time that Paolo um, and Paola, you know, you have to stop and watch and see what your son have been doing in the past years. Okay, so let me um, stop sharing this and let me share my desktop because um, it is worth it. Where is this? Okay, so I have two videos to show you guys tonight. Thank you. 
All right, so that was the first time that um, Rafael Benassi decanted a champagne for us. So, Rafa, can you talk about that? Absolutely. Um, let's talk about decanting. Uh, what can you use for decanters? Um, that night I actually used uh, this, you can maybe see it or maybe not see it, but um, this beautiful kind of uh, crystal bottle that kind of resembles a Billicart. Uh, decanter or you can use uh, something even smaller so this is a, my glass so it's kind of tiny um, why decant champagne um, you don't decant all champagne um, but definitely if you're going to consume champagne quickly you're with a group of people you want to do something a little bit different and maybe you want to kind of energize that champagne a little bit um, especially something like an Ayala where it's relatively dormant and muted and it has these beautiful uh, floral tones, but maybe you want to kind of bring out the brioche a little bit and those uh, dry fruit tones. So uh, you go ahead and decant it and you pour it really, really, really slow into the decanter because you don't want to lose bubbles. Um, and then you simply pour it into a glass. Um, glassware is also important, um, which we can touch on that too. And uh, what I'm going to try to do in the meantime is change my background so I can actually show you this um, here. Um, yeah, and meanwhile, I can ask, so have you seen champagne being decanted before? So the story about that night, so you see we had a great lineup of champagnes. And then we had the Charles Heidsick 2004 or 5. And uh, we tasted that champagne before and after decanting. And it was very different. So go ahead, Hanka. So sorry, here, you can maybe see this better. So this, is, uh, this was the original uh, Billicard decanter that I used at night. Okay, it's made out of crystal. And as the champagne passes through it, it kind of exfoliates the champagne and opens it up. It breaks a little bit of the bubbles too, uh, and really kind of builds up the aromatics. Um, the other decanter that I was kind of showing you that you can use is, is like a simple little guy like this too. So you don't have to pour out the entire bottle and decan it, okay? Um, and I definitely recommend you having some of these around. These are called the uh, little champagne stoppers, okay? So maybe- if, why, uh, why do we use champagne stoppers, by the way? Well, I use champagne stoppers when I drink champagne for breakfast <laughs> and I start in the morning and then I need, wanna have some maybe for lunch and I wanna maybe have some at 3.30, maybe at a happy hour, maybe at 7.30, because you know, you, the idea about champagne, at least for me, is that you can always have champagne. And then as Napoleon said, you know, we have champagne in times of happiness and times of sadness. So there's always a time and a place for champagne, in my opinion. So, Agreed, cheers uh, to that, cheers guys, okay. So, Let's do another toast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's talking about glassware. So at the moment, I'm kind of using something similar to what Alessandro is using, just this little tiny flute. Um, you can use a traditional champagne flute. I recommend these actually for old champagne um, because they're not exposed to oxygen as quickly. And you may have a, like an older vintage champagne, and I'm talking about something that's 20 years old or more. Um, and uh, I, I like using these two for just a simple brute and they kind of look fancy and everybody knows the champagne flute. Um, you can use also larger bowls, okay? I don't necessarily recommend a burgundy glass because it's a little too open and a little too big and you kind of lose the aromatics. Here you still kind of have a curvature that kind of focuses the aromatics in your glass like these two Bordeaux. So you have, you have a like a high stem Bordeaux or a low stem Bordeaux depending on what your preferences are. And then don't forget to always have some acrylic glasses for your pool and outside boating, whatever you got kids around, that kind of scenario. So it's good stuff. Cool. All right. So um, <clears throat> let's move on and uh, we'll share my screen again um, so we can continue to see the presentation. Uh, yeah, okay, so that was 2017, okay? So 2017, um, we did four events, it was great. Um, and so, you know, came 2018, and we said, okay, what should we do? So we went big. 2018, we did six events, 
six events. By the end of that week, I was tired, but you know, totally worth it. So we began uh, 2018 on a Monday and that was the lineup for the Monday. And I was very thankful to have some other brands now participating with me, uh, GH Mom and Peggy Ajoué. Uh, they were our partners in 2018 as well. And I have Elise in here. Um, <clears throat> Hi Elise, thank you so much. So Elise and I, we traveled together to Champagne last year. Uh, she is with Peggy Joué, and so, you know, uh, hopefully we'll do some Peggy Joué in 2020. Let's talk about that later. Uh, so yeah, that was the lineup, and uh, so we did the champagne experience. So in here you see um, Brenda, Celeste, and Nicole, and uh, you know, in 2018, Nicole was working full-time, and then, uh, you know, Celeste did a representation about soils, and then Brenda did a food and wine pairing or something. And yes, my sister and my uh, brother-in-law were there as well. So it was, was great. It was super special. Um, and this was just the Monday, okay? Come Tuesday, and uh, we did the Winwood Walls. And that was an amazing event. So it was, you know, first perfect weather in Miami. I was afraid it was going to rain. So perfect weather in Miami, perfect champagnes. Um, the food was delicious as well. We had an art teacher and, uh, you know, we learned about the art. And in here, you can see that's my sister, um, you know, with myself. And yeah, it was a, a very casual event. And then again, we had Gose, GH Mom, Charles Heitzig, Peggy Jouet, and Drapier Rosé. So great lineup of champagnes. So imagine tasting all of that in open air with good weather in Miami. That was, um, yeah, an amazing, an amazing night as well. So a uh, very fun night. One of the best, I think, events for Miami Champagne Week we ever did. Um, and you know, people in here, uh, let me know what you think, because I think that was one of the best events we ever did. Um, all right, so again, Mr. Benassi was back, you know, because every year he has to be back. So um, we did, um, that was the uh, Wednesday then. So we did a Bilicar Salmon Masterclass and Raf, tell about the lineup. All righty, uh, gee, where do I start? Uh, so Bilicar Salmon, probably one of my favorite uh, passions uh, in, in wine in general, or one of my favorite houses. Um, these guys come from the city of uh, uh, Mersuai and uh, were established uh, also in the uh, 1800s, um, about 15 minute drive from Ayala, if you will. And their style or what they're really, really known for is balance. I, I would really stress that with this champagne. Um, and Billicard Simone, ironically, like this beautiful bottle of rosé here that I have, um, or I actually rem, um, remember a later event that's coming up, but I want to spoil the fun, but I'll let Alessandra introduce that uh, at a little restaurant, and I'll show you a bottle that I actually kept from that night. Um, but make a long story short, uh, Billicard Simone is, uh, is a family uh, joint venture still today. Uh, they are 17 generations family owned and operated. They are a grand mark and only one of three that are family owned and operated uh, today. With, with uh, the family of Mr. Billicart uh, joining Mrs. Madame Simon. So Miss Madame Simon had the vineyards, Mr. Billicart had the finances. They got married, started Billicart Simon. Um, and uh, you can call it salmon and it goes really well with salmon, but try to pronounce it Simon. Um, and then it's not Billy's cart, driving salmon, but you know, you can, you can bill a car some on. Anyways, um, the lineup that we had, we, we started off with uh, their zero dosage wine, extra brute. Uh, then we went to a vintage extra brute, uh, which sees a little bit of oak aging actually, uh, and during the fermentation process. Then we went to their Blanc de Blancs, which by the way, I think they're one of the most riveting producers of Blanc de Blanc uh, on the planet. Um, they're, world-renowned rosé, uh, which I have to say probably if, if you guys are into rosés, I want to say Laurent Perrier, um, 
Billicard Simone are kind of your, your two pillars. Um, and we're going to have some rosé coming, so I won't spill the fun there, and I'll go back to the rosés, but just keep in mind those kind of styles. Uh, we tried Subois, which is that funny label with kind of looks like a, a wooden barrel, if you will. And uh, Subois literally means on oak. And this is uh, an homage to uh, producers such as Krug and Bollinger, who do first fermentations 100% in, in, in oak. And uh, this is kind of an homage to that style, an older production method, if you will, uh, of champagne, because all champagne used to ferment in oak barrels in the past. Um, so kind of going back to that old traditional and what they're, they're trying to look for here is an added layer of character, but not an oaky wine. So I don't want you to think of, okay, they oak for men, so it's going to be you know, your uh, Butterball California Chardonnay. No. Um, it just has a, a hint of spice, if you will, some added spice, a little more toned brioche. So maybe where it was lightly toasted on the Ayala, here you would have something that has a little heavier toast or has a golden caramel on the bread already, if you will. And then we go to their world-renowned NFB, or Nicholas Francois Bilcard. Uh, this is their Tete de Cuvée, and uh, we have two of them here because we decanted one to show everybody uh, the difference between a decanted and non-decanted vintage champagne. Uh, we happen to be tasting, I believe, the 2002 vintage, which is a 99-100 point uh, wine. And to top that off, NFB, or if people tell you, hey, have you had Nicholas Francois Billcart, or have you heard of NFB from Billcart? Well, maybe you haven't heard about it today, but keep in mind that um, Mr. Richard Euling had a huge tasting. He's the world master of champagne uh, to bring in the year 2000, invited 150 top champagne wineries, and, and Billicart ended up coming in first place for their vintage, but also second place. So uh, first place goes to 1959, uh, Billicart Simone NFB. Second place is 1961. Uh, third place is Champagne Gosset, the oldest uh, winery of Champagne. Um, Champagne Runart is your oldest champagne house for those who are kind of technically geeky on this kind of stuff. Um, but uh, Champagne Gosset came in in third place with their 1947 uh, Grand Reserve uh, vintage. And uh, last but not least, Dom Perignon with their 1964 uh, for fourth place. So that kind of gives you a good uh, summary of what these wines are. These are not only collector wines, but they're some of the uh, pinnacle benchmark producers of today. Yeah, so it was, you know, another fun event. And when Rafa says, I decanted one bottle, it is not true. He decanted four bottles because, you know, it is a large audience. We had 40 people. So he had to decant these bottles and then, you know, we'll serve the bottles and everything. And people will, um, would post this on social media and everything. So yes, Erin is here, Mary is here, Celeste is here. So yes, um, it is always a fun moment when he does that uh, because, you know, everybody wants to see, okay, will we lose the bubbles and what's uh, the taste like? So it is always, um, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, then we had an event that Nicole did. And then um, on Friday, we had a Tattinger dinner at Zuma here in Miami. So we had, um, you know, delicious food uh, from Zuma and we tasted Tattinger Brut, the Rose, the Demi Sec, and, uh, and one vintage as well. And this is, Antoine Colette from uh, Cobrant. So he, that me was a dream. Yes, Nicole is telling me it was great. Yes, a lot of people, we had 30 something people. So it was a little crowded, but yeah, the meal was insane. And so, you know, that was Friday night, amazing. So after five days, you think, okay, you're done with it. You're finished, right? We had a six event and that was a tough one. So, our six events, um, it was, you know, just me and Raphael and the chef, which was Tadashi uh, and his team. And we had eight guests. Is that correct, Rafa? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Eight guests. Eight guests. Okay. Eight very lucky guests, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> so the lineup was insane. 
because you know we tasted all of these champagnes uh, in here, and Rafa will tell a little bit more of, of, about the Billicard. And you know, so we had Champagne Salon in the middle of all of this. We had Bollinger RD 2002. We had Charles Heitzig 1985. So that was the level of the event. And the Ayala, he kept on pouring people. So, you know, explain about it. Why did you pour Ayala all the time? So we actually used uh, uh, Ayala's original recipe um, or what we call as Brut Nature Majeure. Uh, which is the silver label uh, for all of you, those that inquire. And it, it's, um, it has zero sugar. They literally uh, disgorge the bottle, get the leaves out, and they use another bottle to fill the, the, the wine or product that was lost from disgorgement. So um, Brut Nature, what that does to your palate, it, it's, it's a sheer palate cleanser. Uh, so it literally strips everything away, um, all the saliva that you had, and it actually makes you salivate. So it makes you want to eat more or taste more, but it makes your saliva glands on fire. So you're literally, when you're eating it, just it's like an explosion of flavors going into your palate after you've had uh, an Iala Brut Majeur. So I used it not only as a palate cleanser for the, the food that was coming, but most importantly, a palate cleanser for the champagne that was coming to go with your sushi to give you a different level. And then you also use the Ayala maybe as your kind of benchmark, if you will. So, okay, I know what Ayala is going to deliver me. How is this new champagne? Or what's all the fuss with this 200? Or what's all the fuss with 1985 vintage? Does it even have bubbles? I mean, yeah, and it did. And it was amazing. Um, the highlights for me for that night were uh, from the very elegant, uh, light, uh, very laser focused style was probably the Salon 2004. Uh, for the more masculine, uh, broader, rich, layered, highly complex was the Charles Seitzig 1985. Um, overall palette winner for me though was the Bollinger RD. That wine was I mean, I have some aging right now because I thought we killed a small child during that evening as a as a champagne child baby. Okay, don't 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 misread that. Um, but uh, the wine that was the most impressionate that we had that night was this, and I actually have the empty bottle. It's oh, empty. that's cool. Okay? So this was the first Magnum of Cuvée 200 would be opened in the United States. And Florida Wine Academy and Alessandra were the ones to kind of initiate that. And what is Cuvée 200? Cuvée 200 was a celebration of the, of, uh, the 1818 200 anniversary in 2018 um, for this Champagne Week, essentially, and for the birthright to Billicard Simone. So they came up with a 20-year Cuvée blend to make up their 200 um, anniversary blend. Just to kind of give you an idea, they only made 1,818 magnums. It only came in magnums. Um, 1818, again, being their, their date of birth. And the magnums wholesale at $1,500 starting. So if you're able to find any of this that it was not consumed, um, you're probably looking at something like a $3,000 bottle of champagne. Yeah, it's a magnum, but it's a hefty little number. Uh, very collector's worthy, along with everything else on here. The 1985 Charles Heitzig was uh, delivered to us in a, this beautiful um, teak wooden box from the Carrières de Reims. So uh, if you ever visit the city of Reims, there's five uh, houses that share the Carrières or these chalk mines that were uh, originally designed by the Romans. And uh, the Romans used them for to to quite honestly bear the winter of Champagne because it has a very harsh winter, and and later today they're used by producers like Tattinger, Pomery, Charles Heitzig, who has the largest um, uh, remnants or museum, uh, if you will, in the Cobs, uh, just to name a few of the producers that are there in the in the center of Hans. Um You can also have uh, the house of um, Sorry, I just had a, I had a mental brain block there. Uh, Runart, sorry, is also uh, located there along with Tattinger. 
So um, meanwhile, open your Charles Heidsick, guys. So we'll taste that soon. So, um, but you know, just, just, so this was an event for eight people. Do you see the bottles of champagne here? They finish all of this. And you know, as Rafa was saying, he was using Ayala as a palate cleanser for these people. And they drink the Ayala too. So it was funny because, you know, when Guilherme came to pick me up at 1 a.m., I don't know what time it was, he said, okay, is there champagne? And we said, no, they drink it all. <laughs> yeah, we went, through, we went through four bottles of Ayala plus all the bottles you see there in addition to. So yeah, pretty epic night. Um, yes, everybody Uber home or was chauffeured home that night for, uh, for their own safety. Yeah. <laughs> So my favorite that night was the Charles Heidsick 1985 because it was so complex and so delicious. And I think the Cuvée 200 was just so elegant and refined. So, um, so you know, and I am a big fan of Salon. I am a big fan of Bollinger, but it's just, you know, the elegance of the Cuvée 200 and then the Charles Heidsick with so much complexity, those were my favorite champagnes. And, you know, we had Celebris Gosset 2002 in here, Lamont, uh, Lamardier Bernier in here, right, Rafa? Yep, Lamardier Bernier, um, 2007. This was uh, uh, Cuvier La Fonte, uh, which is their uh, reserve, if you will. We also had Bill Card Simone's Cuvée Elizabeth, which is their higher tier, 100% um, estate rosé. So if you will, uh, if, you, if you like Billicard Simone Rosé, the Elizabeth Rosé is on another plateau. Let me just say that. So it is like the uh, mecca of rosés, if you will. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we had uh, different expressions of Bollinger and, you know, Celebri Gosse, just the name in itself, Celebri, let's celebrate. Uh, this was actually something that they've started doing recently and uh, the 1998 vintage was the first vintage they had released, Celebri, and 2002, which was the vintage we had here, was the second making uh, from that producer. So that, and again, Gosset was the oldest winery in Champagne, dating back to 1584. Uh, so it gives you some heritage there. Uh, but I have to agree with, um, with Alessandra, the, the Charles Heidsick 1985, we paired it with a, with a scorched mackerel that had a little bit of fresh grated wasabi. Um, and a you little remember bit of, uh, what we ate? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I took pictures of everything and I won't, yeah. yeah. It, it was a divine evening that, that night. Um, and uh, the chef had made this like a little uh, soy glaze, if you will, um, that, that had some slight sweetness to it, but also had that umami sensation. And I had the champagne first. And the champagne by itself was a liquid meal. I mean, I didn't, I didn't need the mackerel. I didn't need the sushi. I didn't need the restaurant. I didn't need Alessandra there. I just poofed, went to like this little tiny cloud of champagne heaven and was there in my own little world. But then when I had the mackerel with this champagne, um, you notice my white hairs? That's, the white hairs are from the burning of my head exploding when I had that tasting. So, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty mind blowing, very, very intense. And, uh, just the layers. And I think Alessandra, if you remember, I think you counted something like two and a half, three minute finish on the wine. It was super long. It yeah. was. And it, it was funny cause you know, for most of the people in there, they didn't like the Charles Heidsick as their best wine. No. Because it was overcomplicated for some people. I so, agree. So. <laughs> you know, and I'll put it out there. Um, if, if you're going to drink older champagne, you have to maybe be open or willing to understand slight oxidation, first and foremost. And also the development of that champagne as it ages. Because, um, and if you ever do one of the courses with Alessandra, she displays a beautiful chart that shows you Quite frankly, the evolution of just a, an apple, if you will, to the aging profile of champagne. So an apple like a Yala would be a Granny Smith apple that's one, two, three years old, if you will, with aging, right? Because a Yala is age 36 months. So this gives you still that Granny Smith crispiness. 
Um, but if I double that or triple that, my Granny Smith is going to start to change. It's going to start to have more of a baked Granny Smith flavor. And then something like an 80, 85, quite frankly, was almost like a salted caramel apple um, that, that ended up coming out. So you can kind of have a transition and a phase of the evolution of the wines um, in that process. And that's, that's what intrigues me to, to older champagnes or quite frankly, older wine in general is this, what, what is the voyage that's going to bring me through? And I, and I think this experience and again, Alessandra and her team were probably the only people to really kind of wrap their head around in Florida in putting a program like this so early. Um, and what I mean by early is that maybe Miami isn't ready to understand all these little tiny boutique champagnes. Uh, but, you know, definitely Alessandra and Florida Wine Academy took, took an avant-garde approach. And, and I thought it was absolutely successful. And I mean, I still received texts and emails from the individuals that ate that night asking me when we're doing it again. So that's, yeah. a, good, that's a good summary of that event, I think. Yeah, it was fantastic. All right, guys, so with that, we will taste, or if you still have in your glass, um, Champagne Charles Heidsick Brut Reserve, okay? So um, a couple of people had a question in here. So um, Sheila says, when you can use a coupe? Um, and, um, you know, in my view, Sheila, a coupe is... Um, so the, the whole reason you have flutes are to keep the bubbles and to keep the aromas, right? A coupe is too wild, white. So you will lose the aromas and flavors super fast and then you lose the bubbles too. So coupes are great for uh, cocktails with champagne, if you will, or you know, if you're going to be invited to a James Bond party, use the coupe. But other than that, I wouldn't. Raf, what do you say? I agree with you. I think a coupe is for immediate consumption. Literally, um, you know, the, the coupe was actually invented in Italy for Franciacorta beverage. And uh, quite frankly, we love to just gulp it all down. Um, and, you know, the coupe actually only holds about two and a half, three ounces of wine. So it's really, really kind of a small glass as well. Uh, but to the most significant point is that you're not going to build aromatics because the aromatics are just going everywhere. Um, so really it's, it's only going to depend on what's hitting your palate at that time. But um, like I said, if you want to do a toast or like Alessandra said for toasting or an aperitif or something very informal uh, and kind of fun or, or yeah, because you just want to just qualifiably drink uh, champagne, then have some, uh, have some, coops, if you will, in play. Okay, so Charles Heinzig Brut Reserve. Um, so they use one third of each grape and, um, and they use 60% of the grapes coming from this year and then 40% coming from reserve wines, meaning older wines. So that is why the champagne is so different than the Ayala. So the Ayala was good and delicious. This is actually a step up to that. And you see the complexity and this nose that has a lot of dried fruit aromas and um, this chalky minerality. So um, I think it is an amazing champagne. Um, you know, they, the, they call it the 60-40-10 rule at Charles Heitzig. So um, 60 crews blended together 40% coming in from their reserves, and the 10 is 10 average years aged on the 40% of the reserves. This 40% this reserves being aged an average of 10 years is what makes Charles Heitzig, in my opinion, extremely special today. This, for me, is probably the best value, bang for your buck, champagne that's between something that is uh, crisp, refreshing like an Ayala, but something that has some age to it. So you can start to appreciate some, some of the reserve qualities uh, of the wines here and that briochiness and biscuitiness. But as to Alessandra pointed, the dried fruits, um, you get a little bit of uh, like um, tones of uh, truffle and balsamic and things like that too as well, developing into the wine, which, which are really, really uh, unique. Um, 
pairings here, whereas maybe Ayala, I want to have kind of an aperitif and um, uh, fruitfully fun kind of a wine. Uh, this is this is a little bit more serious. If if I really want to have a salted ribeye steak, I probably would actually enjoy what the bottle of Charles Heitzig, quite frankly, more so than maybe your average choice of red wine. Uh, if you wanted to kind of turn things up a little bit. Uh, a really cool pairing too with Charles Heitzig is if you're uh, a fan of prosciutto and you do a prosciutto melone. So prosciutto with a little bit of a cantaloupe or a honeydew melon and, and have the pairing of Charles Heitzig. The salinity from the prosciutto and the super sweetness of the melon combined with the complexity of their Charles Heitzig really kind of gives you a tertiary uh, umaminess created in your palate that's really, really intriguing. But I think, again, here, big bang for your bucks. Yes, maybe it's $10 more than your Moet Chandon and your Yellow Label and, you know, other champagnes that you're more accustomed to seeing out there. But I think the extra 10 bucks will give you 20 years of, uh, of experience, if you will, in a champagne uh, that they're having. Also, you can also check on the back of your bottle. It shows the disgorgement dates. So kind of shows you an authenticity label of when the wine was put in the bottle. It usually says bottled in and then disgorged on. The seven, uh, 750s and Magnums have it. I don't know if the half bottles have it. Um, yeah, they don't have it uh, in the half bottles. But yes, I have seen that in the 750s. Uh, it, it does say the disgorgement date, meaning you can you know um, how long this champagne is be, been sitting on a shelf. Yeah, so. their average is four years minimum. Um, the previous release to the current release of the Brut in the market actually aged for eight years. Um, so it's not a recipe, if you will, a cookie cutter recipe. It's more about what do we need to do in order to, uh, preserve the quality and this profile and this style of champagne. So they use the master blending of their reserve wines to counterbalance uh, this current vintage, which is made up of 60% of the wine. So uh, that's really, in my opinion, the artistry of champagne and what champagne winemakers are, are so special amongst other winemakers is really their the art and blending technique and how fine-tuned they're, they're able to blend and kind of give you a Coca-Cola-like product that's always consistent over year over year, but they're using different raw materials every vintage based on Mother Nature. So, um, so we had a comment before, and I want to touch on that. So Brenda was asking about the difference between the 750 bottle and the 375. And so, you know, there is a process in Champagne, which is called transversage which, you know, for the split bottles, they use that, for instance, or for big format bottles, they use that as well, which means the champagne is going to be on, uh, to be, you know, the second fermentation is going to be done in 750 bottles, and then it is going to be, you know, filtered and transferred to mini bottles or to larger format bottles. But in the case of 375, I think some houses do the second fermentation in here. So um, I'm not sure about Charles Heitzig. So Ralph, if you know any of the houses that do that, because it is a very costly process. Because think about that, you know, having a fermentation inside a mini bottle is, is very costly. So I want to know from you, and I want to know from Elise as well, who handles Mum and Perrier Jouet, if you do second fermentation in 375 milliliter bottles or only in 750, and then it is transversage. So for Ayala and Charles Seitzik, uh, they both age in 375s, but that is the smallest size they produce. They do not produce any 187s uh, or anything like that whatsoever. 375 is the smallest. And their main thought process is that they're still able to have a champagne cork on these bottles. Yeah. Um, and therefore the aging process is not as affected um, as much as in would be in a 187 where you have a crown cap or a plastic uh, enclosure most of the time. Uh, so from a quality perspective. I will say though that all the wineries, including Bill Cart Simone, that also do 375s as well and Bottle Direct, they've all told me 
the bottle evolution of a 375 is going to be a lot quicker than your 750 to that a lot quicker to your Magnum to that a lot quicker to your Jeroboam. So the larger the format, the longer your aging potential is. Um, the shorter the format, the faster you may want to go ahead and consume that. So um, especially when it comes to rosé, rosé will also have a lot of color change or, or uh, oxidation of the color happening in half bottles a lot quicker because the glass is thinner. So UV light can get through and damage the color of the wine as well. So keep that in mind. If you're going to buy a 750, um, I would go ahead and make sure to consume it sooner than later. And then if you want to collect wine, I would start at 750s, if not magnums or higher uh, for, for your collecting of sellers or something on a special moment, if you will. Okay, so I was trying to, to give uh, Elise the microphone in yes. here, but I cannot make you a panelist, Elise. I don't know why. So Elise is talking about Mum and Peggy Jouet, and she says they only do if it is six liters or larger. Everything else is method, a method traditional. Wow. So um, meaning it is going to be the traditional method. Um, okay, thank you. All right. Okay, let's move on and we will begin to talk about 2019. Okay, because it is 714 and we still have one champagne to taste and some more questions in here. So um, 2019, we decided to do four events, which was good enough. You know, we didn't need uh, to, to host so many events. So again, we began on a Monday at Florida Wine Academy, tasting this great lineup of champagnes. We had Tattinger just as a welcome champagne. And then we had Vilmart, which is, um, you know, a, a small champagne house. We had Billacar Salmon, NFB, or no, and yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We had Comme de, de Champagne, Tantanger. We have uh, Gosset Celebris again. Charts High Tick Blanc de Millenaire 2004. Drapier Grand Sandre, Dom Perignon, and Champagne Cristal. So it was, you know, great. And we had a, a chef, a private chef. So Alex um, was there to, you know, and for every champagne, we had one dish. So again, 14 lucky people were there. So many of you um, attended and it was an amazing champagne. Yes, Mary was there. So it was amazing to taste these champagnes, you know, side by side and to compare and contrast. And for the last three ones, so Cristal, Dom Perignon and Drapier was the same vintage, so which was 2008. And it is a great vintage, so we could compare this. So yeah, um, it was an amazing event that was on Monday. And then we had um, uh, a master song. So in here, you can see Jacqueline. Now it was here, um, uh, her first champagne week, right, Jacqueline? And for Sarah as well. So Sarah teaches for us as well. She teaches the Blissity Level 3. Um, and she moved from London to Miami last year. And Jacqueline was attending her first champagne week with us. Uh, and we had a, quite a lineup, which was really interesting. And, um, you know, we compared uh, aged champagne with new champagne. And then, uh, as you can see for the picture in here, we had a flute and we compared the flute with a white wine glass to see how different or how similar the aromas would be. Notice the wine mats, please. The wine mats now are beautiful, right? Uh, very different than um, when I did. Yes, I think Irene was there as well for this uh, first Champagne Week. So yes, we had a great lineup and, you know, Master Som, uh, Matt Citrilla, he was fantastic presenting uh, this Full House, a very successful <clears throat> um, seminar. And then on um, Thursday, we had the pleasure of having Rafael Benassi again, <laughs> another year, right? And we did Bollinger. And, you know, personally, I, I am a fan of Bollinger. So it was great for me to finally have a dedicated seminar um, about that champagne house. So we began with uh, Ayala and tasted all the way, all the way to uh, Bollinger RD 2004. So, uh, Raf, I have a video as well. Did you uh -oh. might know what the video is about. 
But you know, talk a little bit about the lineup. All right, so uh, this is, um, as I was telling you about before, uh, Bollinger kind of revived Ayala. So we started off with their uh, opposing style, if you will. So Ayala is 100% uh, stainless steel fermented, sees no oak whatsoever, and the base of these wines are usually Chardonnay dominated. Uh, Bollinger, uh, 40 to 50% of all the cuvee of um, Bollinger non-vintage cuvees see barrel fermentation. So again, 40 to 50% of non-vintage see barrel fermentation. Everything that's vintage from Bollinger sees 100% barrel fermentation. These barrels are on average 40 to 200 years old. They have a cooper uh, that all he does, it doesn't make new barrels. He maintains the old barrels. Um, because they don't want to impose an oak flavor to these wines. What they want is micro oxygenation to occur. And this house, along with Krug, um, is probably the, the, are the two pillars, again, if you will, uh, of this style of champagne. What does micro oxygenation do? It, yeah, it gives you definitely a different profile. These are not fruit forward wines, these are complex, uh, layered. Um, briny, salty, umami-centric wines. Um, again, amazing for food pairings and especially for uh, all Asian delights. Uh, but again, don't be afraid. And I think um, Eddie from uh, Fleming's is on board here. And I did this with him one day and we actually had a bottle of Bollinger on vintage with, with some filet and ribeye uh, pieces and kind of showed him the difference between a regular just having a bite of steak without champagne and then what that steak becomes when you have a bite of champagne, kind of like a Bollinger that sees a little bit of uh, this micro oxygenation. Uh, these wines are Pinot Noir based, so they are kings of Pinot Noir. So for their portfolio, this gives you kind of a great uh, blend, if you will, if you don't know what to buy or you want to have a really contrasting pairing one night, is buy a bottle of Ayala and then get yourself a bottle of Bollinger non-vintage. Um, same qualitative caliber, just two completely different styles of wine that can cater to two different dining aspects or the same dine, uh, uh, dining regimen in one night, but giving you two totally different windows to champagne. So uh, Bollinger goes back to 1829, and they do have an association with the famous uh, James Bond. Uh, which okay. I'll leave at this off. point. Yes, exactly. I'll leave this point up to Alessandra. So, <laughs> all right. So, um, so yes, we were very lucky because you know um, now with this great relationship, we could ask for something else, right? So, um, and yes, Bond has this relationship with James Bond, and they were um, launching something. So, let me show you something in here. Just. Bear with me for a second, guys. Okay. All right, let me share my screen again. And let me put the volume up, because you need to hear that, okay? Oh. <laughs> yeah, who's this guy, right? So. <laughs> oh! That was Brenda's O, by the way. <laughs> Our number one fan. Yeah, short video, you know, we did with our cell phones, but just to show, um, um, you know, uh, it was the launch of this. Um, Bond Bollinger and, and we did it at the event. So it was a great, you know, and the bottle is beautiful. Raf, you can talk about that. Um, so again, uh, Florida Wine Academy pioneering with something. So they were the first to uh, get their hands on some uh, Bollinger uh, 2009 Blanc de Noir. So 100% Pinot Noir uh, released for the inaugural uh, uh, new movie. Uh, that just came out, so of uh, James Bond. I, I think so, it never came out, the movie. I don't think it came out because of our current status. 
Um, but it was supposed to come out in April. Uh, there has been some viewings of it, so I have seen uh, portions of the movie already out, if you will. Uh, so hopefully we have something to look forward to. Uh, but definitely a collector's piece. Um, it had, as you can see, it had this lid that literally you tap open and it would prop open and it would literally prop the bottle up. Very, very, very cool. Uh, and it has, um, uh, it's a crystal uh, door, this glass door that it has, and it has all the remembrance of all the James Bond movies or all 25 movies that have uh, come out. So it's also a 25th anniversary of James Bond. I, I will say this, that this is one of the only um, relationships, if you will, at this level that are a gentleman's handshake. There is no money exchange here or, or any sponsoring, if you will. Um, just Bollinger was mentioned in the original uh, uh, author's writings when they, when they wrote 007. And if you look at the movies back in the early times, he would always order a bottle of RD. Um, and uh, RD 1967, to be specific, was, was James Bond's favorite uh, champagne. Uh, or still is, actually. So, because uh, if you have a bottle of that 1967, let me tell you what an experience that is, so. Cool, all right. And so in the last event we had for uh, 2019, so we closed the week with a champagne dinner uh, at Fleming Steakhouse with Charles Heitzig. So again, Rafael Benassi is here, and then you can see you know, a lot of our um, clients, friends. So yes, Jaime, Olga, uh, Erin, Claudia, Alessandro, and Mariana, Maria, Antonio, uh, Carr and Cheryl, Mary was there, so Nicole, myself, Chris Ingalls was there, Brenda, of course, you know, Anthony. So um, yes, so it was an amazing. So we had so much champagne. And you know, that was such a fabulous event because the food was delicious, and you know, we drank a lot because that it was the Friday. So you're allowed to drink and, and we stayed on for, um, so yeah, it was, it was delicious. That was a fabulous event, yeah. I, I have to give kudos to the Fleming's team um, because, you know, uh, I have to say that I, I probably have hosted over 500 wine dinners um, and this was top notch. The service, the food, the pairings, the timing, um, kudos to you guys. That, the people was great. Oh my, it was it was awesome all around. Um, but you know, I, I just got to give kudos to the to the Fleming's team there. They did a really really awesome job. So um, obviously, our guests made it extremely fun. Um, the uh, champagne was definitely flowing, and I think that helped everybody have a lot of fun. Uh, but uh, kudos to Fleming Sprinkle, man. You guys are an awesome team. Cool. All right, guys, with that, go open your last champagne, okay? Because um, we have only that champagne to taste, and then we'll talk about uh, what to expect next. So, yes, this is a full bottle, okay? So if you have the two previous ones as, um, as half bottles, this is a full bottle. I'll try to open it. You know, not, not as good as Guilherme. He's not here. Yeah, come in here. Help me. <laughs> oh my gosh and champagne that was good that was good that was good yeah yes the tiny ones has have a little bit less pressure so it wasn't too bad so all right so uh last champagne is the Voiran Jumel Rosé de Sagne and okay Raph you want to talk a little bit about you know first this producer who are yeah. they I never heard about them so Go ahead. So uh, who is Varen Jamel? Uh, Varen Jamel is 11 generation champagne growers. Okay. So everybody that we had, Ayala, Charles Seitzig, Bill Carr, Bollinger, um, Krug, uh, Louis Roeder, everybody, PJ, everybody that we talked about right now are essentially negotiants. They have uh, estate holdings. Uh, some do, some don't. Um, they have estate holdings, but what makes the difference between a grower and a producteur manipulant or, um, uh, is essentially somebody who makes champagne a hundred percent from their estate vineyards. So that's what a Jamel does. 
and that's what they do. Uh, are these wines better than the Grand Marks? I wouldn't necessarily say they're better or worse or anything like that, uh, but you're just experiencing a micro picture from somebody's estate and a microcosm in this particular instant coming from Cremont. Um, one of the four female winemakers is Alice Verin. So Alice Verin is one of the four female winemakers in Champagne today. You had two of them. You uh, had Jennifer Collette with Ayala, and you're finishing up with the Verin Jamel. This is 100% Pinot Noir as well. Relatively hard to find uh, a, a Blanc de Noir Rosé. Okay, so uh, really, really cool, very different. And on top of it, it is Saigne. So you guys can see this dense color, and ironically, I have a, a glass of, well, this was my Ayala. And here's a glass of Billcart. See that color? That's, That's a full glass, Ralph. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm planning to enjoy it, obviously. Um, but this is uh, Billicart Simone, and you can definitely see the color difference between this and your Sagne Verin Jamel, which has that kind of blood orangish kind of hue to it. So, um, Alessandra, maybe do you want to talk a little bit about that? You want me to hit that on Sagne or? or the difference between blended method maybe, or uh, how Billicar got their wine to be lighter and how these guys have a little bit more color. Go ahead. So um, they spend 24 to 74 hours skin contact. So Sagne literally means bleeding. Uh, or, uh, so the bleeding grapes, because again, this is 100% Pinot Noir. So red skin grape, white pulp, squeeze the grapes, bleeds out red, juice and turns this wine into this electrifying beautiful uh fuchsia red rose petal color um really 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 bright versus your billicard simone which um these guys along with uh, other houses like laurent perrier today uh, as an example um, they actually make a champagne all the way blanc and then at the end they add a little bit of still red pinot noir to make the color. So these are the two different methods, if you will, of allowing for you to produce uh, a rosé champagne. And remember that champagne is the only region where you're allowed to blend a white wine and a red wine in order to get a pink wine. Yeah, so very different champagne. So first, because of the color, totally. we are not used to having that. Right, so if you, if you know Tavel for rosé in the Southern Rome, this is the Tavel of the wines, right? Because it is a lot of color. Let me put a white piece of paper in here for those of you who are not seeing this. This is almost like, you know, a light red wine. So here, compared to, yeah. And here's the average rosé, right? Right. So, you know, Raphael's glass is pale salmon color. And in this glass, it's, it's you know, it's like a pink, really deep pink color. So... Yeah, very different. Uh, so I would, you know, so it's my first time tasting the champagne as well. I have never tasted it before. Uh, I just wanted to show, you know, a different champagne house, a different method of production in here. Um, and I'm surprised. I, I thought the champagne was way more fruitier than it is. Um, I don't think, you know, the dosage of six grams per liter is keeping the champagne savory instead of being sweet and fruity so yeah yes i always want to say don't judge a a book or a champagne or a wine by its cover right don't judge it all the way by its color uh, because i think this is a wine that to, to alessandra's point you're expecting this red fruit intensity but but really it's more uh citrusy and uh, and, uh, and like blood orangey if you will, astringent with like pomegranate and crushed red raspberries that haven't really ripened all the way. Um, so it, it, it really, really intriguing. Amazing pairing with blue cheese. If you have blue cheese and this wine uh, together, because it has that nuisance of that red fruit, uh, really, really cool of, uh, pairing uh, with, with this wine. So guys, for those of you tasting the champagne, um, what do you think? So first of all, price point on this champagne, $43.99. So you see it is you know, great price um, for a full bottle of champagne. 
I think I need, um, you know, a steak for this one because it is quite heavy, right? It is 100% Pinot Noir. It has skin contact. So you do get a little bit, I, I wouldn't say tannins, but you get some structure on the palate. So I need a steak or I need something kind of, you know, more hearthy food. I will add this too for all of you that uh, watched uh, uh, Alessandro's and Nicole's uh, uh, natural wine movement or natural wine webinar. Uh, this champagne house actually falls under that natural wine uh, category, if you will. So um, the only thing that they have in here, uh, they farm 100% organic, everything's hand harvested. Um, they use uh, native yeast fermentation to inoculate all their champagnes uh, uh, fermentations. And essentially, very, very, very low sulfite levels. Um, they're right now uh, applied for the uh, Pro Vin Nature uh, or the Natural Wine Association that was just started in France. So uh, they're waiting for their stamp of certification for being a natural champagne. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very fresh, like uh, Nancy is saying. It does feel fresh on the palate. Uh, I have some fruit. I think, you know, maybe with this one. So yes, as I um, mentioned to you guys, I was tasting in the tulip glass. Maybe for this one, I'll put in the larger glass so it breathes and opens up because it is almost like a light red wine. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, um, so Sheila says, yeah, she totally agree with the blue cheese, more hearty comment, okay, yeah. Brenda says, burgundy glass uh, brisket, yes, I'm mm. with you. <laughs> yeah, barbecue with this wine is, is really, really, really intriguing as well. So anything that has some um, spice aspects or smokiness to it as well would do really well, I think, because of, again, to the sheer intensity of the wine. True. And I see here Jacqueline is tasting a bigger glass. Antonio has a burgundy glass. So great job, guys. Exactly. This is, you know, requires that. Um, awesome. that yeah. All right. So 2020, what should we do? <laughs> so I actually have a poll for you guys. Um, so let me try to launch this uh, in here. Um, Drinking more champagne is obviously, you know, right. The goal. <laughs> it is. Um, let me stop sharing for a minute because I don't know now, Raf. Maybe you, as um, oh. as the host, you you can uh, launch the polls. Uh, yes, I can. All right. All right. Let's do it. All right, guys, there is a poll. It is anonymous and you can vote, vote on multiple times, okay? So we are asking, what would you like to see for Miami Champagne Week in 2020? So you have outdoor events, champagne dinners, champagne seminars, webinars, you know, right? <laughs> hey, we got one person on there, yay! <laughs> so fun events like Boat or Winwood, or do you wanna see a fancy champagne gala? So go ahead and vote. Okay. Yeah, all of the above. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, go ahead and vote. Uh, I think I can vote as well. So let me vote on outdoor events because we need to get out of the house. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And Raf, in a few seconds, I think you can see the results. Can you? Yeah, I can actually. Ooh, uh, so people are power. people are still voting. There's 31 of 38 that have voted, 32 of 38 now. So um, coming in, and we uh, the winner at the top right now is Fun Events Boat and Winwood. Okay. Uh, second place is Champagne Dinners. Third place is Outdoor Events. Uh, fourth is Champagne Gala. Fifth is Champagne Seminar. And last but not least, Webinars. <laughs> 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 so uh, we, sorry that we no, suck no. so bad that we don't want you to be on a webinar anymore <laughs> true so um champagne, i get it guys 
for for the people asking so champagne week is uh, or champagne day is every third friday of october so that means uh october 16 and so we make champagne week that week okay so that means um miami champagne week 2020 it is going to be october 12 to 16 roughly um but yeah Okay. Um, oh, so Melissa is the venue director for Penthouse Riverside Wharf. We can host one of my rooftop. Okay. Awesome. Yes, we can do that. So champagne tasting cruise around Biscayne, Irwin. Yes, I like that. We need to get out. <laughs> so Sarah says, I need a yacht in my life. Sarah, we all do. You know, <laughs> life is not that easy. Um, so let me know when one of you get one. I'll yeah. be there first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so the 16 is uh, the son's 21st birthday. What a great birthday gift! <laughs> you know, you can taste champagne. So. Awesome. Yeah. You know, you should, you should, Jacqueline, you should reach out to uh, Charles Heitzig. They still may have some of that 1985 career available for you. So, uh, not so much. I checked, Raf. You did? Yeah, I had a client asking me for it. So, uh, I, and I was looking for the 79 and 89 as well. So, got it. Yeah. Um, all right. So, yes, uh, October is also Jacqueline's 34. Fifth uh, birthday, um, car is down for the black tie. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so can you close the poll now? Yep. All right. So the winner was Fun Events Boat Winwood. Okay, yeah. People uh, need 25 to out of the 37 of you voted for that. Yeah. I'll send you these uh, poll totals afterwards. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Yeah, so um, normally at this time of the year, it is when we would um, start planning for Miami Champagne Week. Um, it is too soon because we don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, there is going to be a celebration, uh, hopefully outside, hopefully outdoors. If not, there is always Zoom, right, Raf? Yes. <laughs> so, the worst case scenario. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, there is going to be a celebration. Um, I am talking with Laurent Perrier this year, so, you know, hopefully we'll have that. Uh, Elise here from Perrier Jouet, so I'd love to do something with Belle Epoque because the champagnes are just fantastic. So, yeah, we have a lot of planning to do. Um, so, you know, yeah, let's get to work. For sure. The... Um you know, we have, uh, we have some wineries online too, like uh, Champagne Gose that may be interested as well. Um, so guys, don't, don't uh, have your hopes down. There's definitely uh, going to be a cham Champagne Week 2020, uh, regardless of what format we have it in. But uh, there's, there's definitely going to be one. So I would definitely be on the lookout for it as well. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys, before we finish, any other uh, questions, comments about the champagne? Anything else more for Rafael Benassi, our guest? Yes, I see some face mask comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can have one with a slight straw attachment or something for your champagne yeah. consumption needs. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Raf, any final comments, words, or anything? No, I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, putting up with my uh, webinar today. And thank you so much with uh, for Alessandra for uh, having me be a guest on your webinar. And uh, guys, I look forward to Champagne uh, Week uh, and uh, having, having another killer year or of the events with uh, Florida Wine Academy. So, um, don't be afraid to reach out if you need anything. Alessandra has all my contact info or anything like that. So uh, by all means, if you guys have any other additional questions, um, feel free to reach out. But um, there's, uh, for me, there's always an answer and the answer is always, 
if you don't forget whatever you're doing, doesn't matter, you're worried about what pairing it is or what moment you're in, champagne is the answer. So uh, don't, don't forget about that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an easy thing to think about. And like I said, you don't always need champagne to be celebrating something. It could be really uh, an avenue to elevate your culinary and dining experience, if not quite frankly, just have something that's refreshingly bubbling on your palate and uh, keeps you going all day. So cheers to that. Salute. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rafa, for, you know, the ongoing support and partnership. We have done this now for, you know, a few years and we'll continue to do so. It is always great um, to see you in action, decanting champagne, opening Bollinger. So, you know, we'll have to think about what to do for the next time, right? I think I got a trick up my sleeve for the next one. So <laughs> something uh, utilizing a sword of some kind. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Sabraj, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Guys, thank you so much for being with us again. Um, next week, um, Nick Jackson, Master of Wine, will be back for uh, white wines, blind tasting. Okay. And that is probably going to be our last webinar in this format. Because after that week, maybe we'll all be out of our homes. We never know but we will change the format um, as of next week. So Nick Jackson will be here with us uh, next week for white wines. And yes, and then Nicole also has the wine and cheese on Wednesday. So please join us for one of the webinars. And yes, so cheers. Thank you so much, Raf. Salute, Chin Chin. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank Salute. you, Alessandra. All right. Happy Friday, everyone. Happy weekend, too. I was going to say, for those that open three bottles of champagne, you're in for a rock start weekend. <laughs> <laughs> a great start. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great weekend, too. And see Ciao. you next week. All right. Bye. Ciao.